Okay, so we're here with Stuart Ham, one of the finest bass players alive today. Yeah. So <laughs> basically, he's preparing for uh, the release release of his new solo album, and we'll have a few few questions about that and a few other things as well. So, can you tell me a little bit about this record, how it came to be, and uh, how was the creative process for this album different compared to your previous albums? First of all, nice to see you. Uh, thank you for having me here. Um, you know, the last uh, solo release I did, The Diary of Patrick Xavier, was a completely solo bass record and a very personal record. And uh, it took me a while to come up with the concept of what I wanted my next record to be. Record, CD, album, I don't even know what you call them anymore. Um, but uh, going through the two things I wanted to do on this record were uh, my main touring band has been Alex Skolnick on guitar and Joel Taylor on drums. And surprisingly, um, Joel and I have recorded a lot on other people's records, but I've never had him on one of my records. And Alex and I have crazily never, never recorded together. So I wanted to capture us live in the studio for some songs. And I also wanted to do more of a prog prog rock record. So I grew up listening to Yes and all that stuff. Um, and I uh, met another guitar player that did a, a tour with me, great singer named Randy McStein, who now plays guitar with Porcupine Tree and has a great, great voice. So I thought I'd write some, you know, prog rock songs based on some ideas, some musical ideas that I'd had floating around for a while. And that was the impetus. And uh, Sweetwater, the, the mega online music company, also has a recording studio. And I worked out a couple of recording workshops where they can... You can go in and record, and they have uh, people uh, pay to come watch the recording process. And Sean Dealey, the engineer, shows you how to set up the mics and all that stuff. So it's a good good payoff for us to get in the studio. Easy way to do it. So did uh, two sessions there. Flew there. One, uh, I, I flew out Alex and, uh, Gar and uh, Joel. Next time it was Alex and um, Randy McStein. And we uh, then uh, I flew in those tracks I sent to Gergo Borlai, who I had overdo the drums on them. And just a very few overdubs, uh, guest stars on the record. And then I'm mixing them with here in L.A. with Javier Reyes, who's the guitar player for Animals as Leaders, which is really interesting because, number one, he's in a band with no bass player. So he has no idea uh, how to push that bass fader up so you can actually hear it. And like all guitar players, he thinks that all the bass does is double the rhythm guitar. So he needed a bit of an education, but we finally reached a point where it's really good, and he has a completely different take sonically. So the record sounds more modern than if I just did like one, you know, made it sound like Kings Asleep or some old tired prog rock record. So the, there are echoes to prog rock, as you know, there's some Mellotrons and some flying in reverb just to sonically sound like it, but you know, a lot more present, especially in like the drum mixes. You know, they're in the new today. The drums are just more dry and sort of in your face than you know, rare that thing. So the performances are great. The the uh, performances are wonderful. Had um, uh, a woman named Andrea Witt, who's also in my live band, play some pedal steel, uh, and uh, Steve Ferlazzo playing the Rick Wakeman keys, and I have Bubby Lewis uh, guest soloing on a couple tracks. A great, great bass player. Okay, awesome. Now, how do you, like, bass is traditionally a backing instrument, but uh, what's it like to make a bass-centric album since, you know, it's not a lead instrument? How do you create such a record with such an instrument? I mean, it, it's challenging, certainly, because uh, as a, a musician and composer who happens to play bass, in sort of a solo bass environment, I'm able to uh, utilize some of the techniques that I've am well known for or have helped invent or champion uh, to get it across. But if you're writing a, a full on Pink Floyd, uh, you know, uh, UK ish song, then it's just going to sound stupid if the bass is playing everything all at once. So then it's just an arrangement. And then the bassist needs to hit a big open E and put your hands up in the air and let it ring. So that comes down to arrangement. Uh, certainly I feel a little bit of, um, I wouldn't say pressure, but I think that the, the, the very selective audience that will be listening to buy my music expects some sort of, uh, new, exciting bass thing. So I try to put that in there as long as it serves the composition in the song. 
Yeah, absolutely. Now, as far as the gear goes, uh, what did you use on this record? And, you know, was there anything new in there? Can you tell me a little bit more about that? Yeah, well, the, my main bases are these these Warwicks, these prototype Warwicks that uh, Marcus Spangler, who's the main guy, the wood guy at Warwick, built for me. Uh, on one track, when this is over, I had uh, my old Fender Urge one, the short scale that I have strung up as a piccolo bass that I doubled uh, the funky funky bass on. Those are the main axes. I think I have um, some of the others make a, a little bit of a guest appearance, but they, those this is the one. This and the red one like it are the ones that I can really get around the most on. Um, you know, I have my uh, Stu STU Mark Bass uh, signature head and cabinet that we had, you know, delivered to Sweetwater when we recorded. Of course, my sound is is primarily uh, direct, right? Uh, and you use some of the amp for thickening, but in more in like solo bass pieces, you really want the clarity. If I'm doing, like you said, big low notes in a Pink Floyd section, then we'll put in some of the amp. Um, don't use a lot of effects because, again, I, uh, tone comes from here. And, uh, yeah. and what an amplifier should do is amplify the sound you create with the fingers. What a pedal should do would be to color this tone you get, not create a tone, in my opinion. So, uh, you know, I, I have a few of my uh, TC pedals I use, a verb and delay. Uh, and on one song, there's one song called Infinite that's a choir of basses, piccolo, five string, uh, regular bass, all just you know, layers of basses, uh, and that I used a bit of a tremolo for uh, one of the tracks. And the main thing is for um, in the song when this is over, I trade off uh, eight bar phrases with Bubby Lewis. And it's a really funky song, so I've been using a pedal uh, from Sea Moon called the Funk Machine. Are you familiar with that? You... And uh, it's I don't really... know. Uh, it's great. It, it recreates the old like Mutron biphases by Neil Jason. He's a bass player, you know, Breck Brothers and big New York guy. He uh, it's his company, Sea Moon, uh, and uh, that just gets a really nice envelope. I mean, it's great. It's a great pedal in that you really have to work it, man. You got to do the touch and the way you set it up. Micro increments make a big difference. So you know, I tried to experiment with uh, some different things. I'm always trying to do something new with my records and i already have an idea of what my next record will be like which hopefully will be completely different so now yesterday i was listening to your uh charlotte song i think it's from uh, the outbound album from 2000 and like it's basically just you playing your bass and uh with some reverb on there maybe chorus i'm not sure and how do you approach you know writing and arranging such a piece where bass is the only instrument playing and you know no layering whatsoever it's just you how do you approach writing such a piece and making it sound full and covering the chord progression and melody and everything at the same time you know home demos uh and if you know i have you know guitars here but with my piccolo bass uh and with an octave pedal that can go you know a whammy pedal that can go up the octave and a really long delay and a really heavy chorus for a big sustain uh, I can approximate a guitar sound because my hands are too big to play guitar if I pick up a guitar with those little strings and those little frets the tone I get is just is loathsome and vile uh, so uh, and for that song particularly again the, uh, for me a song ha becomes a song when I name it where I know what the song is about or I have an idea it's not just a chord progression and a melody it has to be about something and, and actually, the demo I did on that, I did in San Rafael, California, at Daniel Polselli's little studio. I was running out of room on my little Tascam four-track cassette machine. I, I swore that demo sounds better than the record. It just, I had a, a really good idea, which was just this, this fast groove. That particular song was inspired by the time I was living in the Castro, San Francisco, which is the gayest section. So I would always hear these uh, disco beats from the gay nightclubs wafting up the hill towards my house. And uh, the melody was just meant to be, you know, sort of a Middle Eastern uh, dual melodies that sort of wove in and out of each other. And from there, when I had a firm idea, it was easy to write the two interwoven melodies. I sort of did that as a demo. And then I'm very particular about the way my melodies are played. And I couldn't get any guitar player to play it to, my, to the composer's satisfaction. So I just decided to, uh, to go here and... and you know, plus if, you, if you're playing the melody yourself and you can double it, you can use your own phrasing. And that, that song came out very well.
live I have to use on that particular song a guitar player playing slide and then Andrea plays the second melody on pedal steel and it sounds pretty good. Oh, okay. Now, uh, your uh, record, of course, also features uh, Alex Kolnick, uh, who's a you know, uh, very versatile guitar player. Now, what was it like to work with Alex on this record and, you know, knowing that he's uh, generally known as a metal guitar player, was there anything, uh, what can you expect to hear on this record from him and how, what was it like to work with him? I think, I think he enjoyed this record because it's different than what he does in Testament. It's, it's different than what he does in the Alex Skolnick trio. But, you know, Alex, I've known Alex since probably 1990, which is, what, 33 years now? And he was the yeah. original guitar player in the Urge tour. You know, I had this record called The Urge where I sang, and I had the quasi-hit called Lone Star that featured Eric Johnson on it. And, and at the time, I was, you know, I was the bass guy. I was winning all these Reader's Bowls and stuff. So I auditioned every hair band guitar player person you can think of for that gig. I'm not going to name any names. And, they, and I auditioned them on the song Lone Star, and they all showed up and played Eric Johnson's solo note for note, right? And then Alex showed up and played the melody, and when it was time for the solo, he played his own solo. And I'm like, you're hired. Right? Which is one thing that I, I never really understood. Well, I do. But about Satriani and Vi is that, you know, their solos are composed and they play the same solos every night. Right. Which is cool. Uh, uh, but it's it, the imp improvisation is, is pretty interesting. So Alex was just a young kid back then. I, would, I think that I helped turn him on to, uh, I think I played him Weather Report for the first time and I bought him a copy of Herman Hesse's Siddhartha. And, uh, you know, I'm not going to say I'm responsible for his renaissance as an uh, intellectual and uh, uh, all that kind of stuff. But, you know, uh, we just don't each other for a long time and we're good friends and I respect what he does. I'd never seen Testament play. I'd never been to a metal show until last year. And I finally <laughs> went and saw, saw Testament and Exodus and um, some other loud band. Uh, uh, but uh, so... Uh, you know, we, we've done all these tours where, you know, he likes to play my music. And in this sort of music, it's improvisational music where hopefully we're listening to each other and playing differently every time. Uh, so uh, it was great to finally get him and Joel in the studio. We did a couple songs with that quick track that we we do a version of uh, We Will Rock You, a reggae version that we've been playing live forever. So we just knocked it off the studio. And I, I think I'm pretty good in the studio. Sometimes in the studio, you kind of have to get people pissed off or angry. To get a good take, you know, you can't be a, uh, you can't, you have to play good cop, bad cop. Uh, and I, 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 I'm fortunate to know enough musicians where I think I can write songs that uh, exemplify their strengths, right? And instead of me imagining a guitar solo, I say, well, Alex would be perfect for this song. So it's one song called Flotsam and Jetsam has this uh, uh, B section that is possibly lifted directly from uh, a, uh, the Kinger Olsen transcription of a Bach organ concerto, maybe, maybe pretty close to exact same riff, uh, that he just sounds great on. So yeah, he's wonderful. I, I, I think I know how to get a good performance out of him. And uh, you know, we've just played a lot and he's a, he's a, a super, one of my best friends. And um, I just have a lot of love and respect for the dude. Awesome. Now, without giving us too much like spoilers of your album or anything, can you tell us what was the most challenging piece to record for this album? And can you tell us a little bit more about it? Um, the, I mean, the mixing process has been, has been uh, a, a challenge again because I, I want you have to have a producer because. There's a phrase, I don't know how it translates, but you can't see the forest because you're concentrating on the trees, right? Yeah. So sometimes I'll get caught up in minutia when someone needs to say, dude, it sounds fine, move on, right? So, uh, and I wanted a different sound and I wanted someone, uh, the last like seven records I've done, I did with a friend of mine, James Boblack, up in, up in San Francisco, he wasn't available. So uh, I know Javier and I just thought, you know, I like the sound of those of those records, of the Animals records, and some of the solo stuff. So it the just getting it right, and man, I'm I'm um, I'm pretty hard on myself. I have to say, uh, I have to keep reminding myself that playing bass will never sound 
like um, Glenn Gould playing the piano, and that when you lift your hands off the strings and move them to a different position, there's just a sound created, and it sounds like... <laughs> and there are days when that's all I can hear. And and so we spend about a day trying to, like, you know, edit them out or duck them down, and then it just sounds awful, awful, and you, you just have to let it go. Um, the... Um, the song, the, the title track called "Hold Fast," uh, has yeah. um, a pretty, uh, pretty tricky bass intro, uh, and uh, it's it, it's the beat is is sort, of, is sort of displaced, so it's it's meant to sort of mess with your ear when what you think is the downbeat is really the and before. Um, but now it's been really, it's really. I hired the right people to do this record, so um, yeah, I had to replace some drum parts. I, I have to say. But in the end, they they came out better. So that was a bit of a challenge, politically and just sonically and financially. But uh, <laughs> yeah, no, it's 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 all it's all really come out good. We just have one song left to mix, and it's sort of a real prog rock epic. And there's about seventeen keyboard parts and three bass parts, and it's just taken us forever to mix it. Okay, <laughs> hope we'll hear it soon. So, uh, well, why did you decide to crowdfund this album? Ah, uh, because I needed the money and no one else was giving me any. How's that? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, I mean, we, we, don't, we don't have to go on a depressing rant about the changes in the music industry and the recording industry and yeah. the fact that, like, the only people making music, money off, off downloadable music are people who have never practiced a scale in their life and this middle man. And we're, we're not going to be cynical today or anything. So you just have to roll with the tides because those are things I can't change. Right on a big level, yeah. a small level, maybe I can. So um, I just, you know, spent some of my own money, you know, getting it going and hiring a lot of guys. And then it came down to, well, you know, if I really want to make uh, the packaging good and hire someone good to master it. And, you know, uh, since I'm still going to press up some physical CDs to sell on tour, and I'm, I'll be touring with Greg Howe uh, later this year. And uh, I think my fans are older. They still have CD players, number one. And uh, don't mind supporting someone by buying a CD and being able to look at it. So we're going to do like a big fold-out booklet like the – I was talking with Alex, like for metal dudes, like the packaging is really important, right? And my girlfriend is a heavy metal photographer. She did all the photography in the last Exodus record and stuff. So, uh, you know, we're going to have a pull-out with a big folder of me and my bases. And uh, so the, the that just allowed me to sort of not have to dip too deep into my savings and to have a little money to play with again to – it's good to pay people that are working on your record. It, it, it makes them happier. And so I, I try to make it fun. You know, you know, it's trying to, you know, try to say just, you know, if you're going to wait and download it, you know, for ten dollars off Apple, I'm, I'm, you know, I mean, let's face facts, I'm going to see maybe what, you know, seven cents of that, right, by the time, or a dollar and a half, or whatever. Yeah. So, if you want to spend a little more and have the money go directly to me, great. I have these perks where you know you can have your name in the credits. Uh, you can you have lessons, you can have access to the, the files, the demos, and just you know, fun stuff, lessons, me recording, uh, just ways to get people involved and, again, just to help pay for it. Yeah, I get it. So uh, in the past, you also worked with some of the like, biggest names in the world of guitar. So two of them were Joe Satriani and Steve Vai, of course. How would you compare working with, the, with them? Like, what makes them similar? What makes them different? Uh, man, you know, I mean, I met Steve in uh, 1978 when we were freshman up Berkeley. That's 45 years. That's kind of scary. And obviously through him, I met, I met Joe. Um, you know, Steve's very adventurous. I like that. He's always ambitious. Um, he's also coming from a Zappa world, right? Uh, and yeah. Joe is maybe a bit more melodic. And Joe, like me, and like... Uh, People that weren't had other influences other than Zappa spent time playing in top 40 bands, spent time in hard bands, studied some jazz harmony, understand the AABA form, a more traditional, you know, pop, rock, jazz music forms and sensibilities, right? So, um, yeah, that you know, I mean, obviously, recording with Steve is a challenge because he's a, he's a perfectionist and very demanding. Um, and uh, recording with Joe, he again, man, both those guys. Especially Joe's stuff, 
you know, I mean, most of the bass is just eighth notes, doubling the rhythm guitar. So early on, he would sort of just call me like in Flying with the Blue Dream for Bells of Wall Park 2 when he wanted something else and, you know, a slap or whatever. And, we're, you know, uh, the, the albums that we did sort of, I would say, collaborate, you know, where I had a little more input were Crystal Planet and Time Machine. And uh, that was a fun process, actually getting to, you know, lend, try to lend a voice. He's the ultimate authority, obviously. But no, they're, they're both they're both great. I would you know I, I keep in contact and you know uh, Steve helped with the uh, uh, some of the uh, the camp the uh, financial campaign for putting this record out and I, I you know speak to Joe every now and then and he helped to advertise it too and um, you know it's been fun. They're, they're super big parts of my career and uh, it was just a great time in my life. Another recording that you participated in was the cover of. Uh, Aerosmith's Dream On and it featured Ingby Malmsteen and Ronnie James Dio and I really yeah. wanted to ask you, I mean because obviously I'm a huge Black Sabbath fan and everything so I really have to I promised myself that I'm going to ask you did you get the chance to work directly with Dio or you know how did that go? I, I wish and again um, ah. my girlfriend's a, a, you know born to heavy metal and through Alex so I had, I had some more street cred saying I could play with, you know, I played with, I recorded with Ronnie and they, we actually just in LA about a month ago had a big uh, cancer awareness concert tribute to Ronnie James Dio out in the park and Rudy Sarzo was there and Vandenberg and, you know, I get to play a couple Die Young and, you know, some of these metal songs. It was fun. It was, it was super good. Um, and that, you know, I've done a lot of those sort of tribute records and, um, some of them are sound good and have better performances than that one. That version of Dream On is like just really stands out as a quality recording. And I, I think that it's because whoever recorded it and produced it did well. It was, you know, I just went in the studio with, with Vinny Caligula. It was just he and I to lay down the basics. And, you know, again, Vinny, Vinny you know, was not, I think we both know enough that in that song, I'm not going to be tapping or slapping. I'm just laying down a part, right? A good bass part. Yeah. And Vinny's laying it down. Uh, you know, uh, so number one, you've got a really good rhythm section playing yeah. a supportive groove behind it instead of people trying to show off or whatever, right? There's your bass. And then I think the way that Ronnie deals things that he he, uh, he makes it his own. He, he sticks, he doesn't stick too traditionally to the melody. And um, I think that uh, the reason that uh, it works so well that Ingve. I mean, it's funny because Ingve starts playing fast in the intro and it's like, oh my God, that's fast. And then it just keeps getting faster and faster. It's just, it's so Ingve. you know, I love it. It's awful, I love it. You know, it's just Ingve. Ingve. <laughs> but I think what really works is that whoever was mixing the record, I think turned turned Ingve down every eight bars at the end. So it sounds like he's listening and trading off with Ronnie when you know that he just blew over the whole thing. <laughs> so, he was so not insulting anybody. I'm just saying that's why it sounds so cool because yeah. they're trading off, you know. Yeah. One thing that I always love to ask, you know, well, musicians who have many years of experience behind them, how much do you practice at this point in your career, or do you like effectively practice at all? <sighs> Oh, okay. This is on my music stand right here. Uh, bass duets. Uh, okay. What else do I have on here? I'm working on some oh, Spiegel and Spiegel by Arvo Part. Uh, man, I'm I'm practicing all the time because I love to practice. Uh, I have a lot of things that I can improve on, and I'm motivated to get better. And um, also, just man, if I'm really warmed up, uh, the way my fingers are on the strings, it really improves the sound, and and uh, my happiness makes me play better. So I, yeah, I practice all the time. <laughs> all the time. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, one thing that I also wanted to ask you: Do you perhaps remember what was your first bass that you ever had? You know, and does it have any? Do you still own it? And does it have any emotional value to you? I do remember it because um, I got it for Christmas in 1973. And I've been playing upright bass for a few years and using the school's electric bass and uh, played music all my life, different instruments. When I started playing bass, it was pretty apparent that I had a, a, a you know feel for it and 
Um, so it was the only time I, I searched around my parents' bedroom when they were at work to see if, if I was going to get a bass, and I found my Christmas present before Christmas. It was a uh, it was called Alvarez. I think my parents bought it at a pawn shop in Champaign, Illinois, and it was a uh, copy of a Gibson the S, SG double cutaway, you know, with the little horns on the side. And the funny thing was, is yeah. that, of course, the first thing I did when I got it was put a uh, – a silver surfer sticker on the head on the headset, so it sort of pre-shadowed my surfing with the alien days. So no, I, yeah. I sold that a long I, long ago to uh, I think the guy who was the number two bass player in the jazz band, the school band I was in when uh, my parents bought me my first uh, jazz bass in '74. So I don't have either of those two basses, sadly. Ah. okay, okay. Um, one thing there's the um was it recently earlier this year um you and was it jeff berlin that you commented on a post online and uh it was this common misconception shared by um uh, dave mustaine saying that all the bass players do uh is just double what the guitar is doing now do you think that after all these years bass is still you know underappreciated instrument in any way uh, personally, I don't care. I mean, <clears throat> no, I mean, personalities. I mean, there's a reason why Dave Mustaine is a guitar player and not a bass player, because no no bass player would, would say that. Well, no, I rip on guitar players nonstop, <laughs> so I take that back. Um, <laughs> no, I think a mature bass player, just that's in, in, in if you're playing in, in uh, Megadeth, that's what you're going to be doing. Again, it's like, you know, people are like, could you imagine how, how, and I, you know, I love Billy. Billy's a good friend of mine. Billy's one of the most incredible forces of nature, but it would have sounded awful in Van Halen. Right? You, yeah. You, that, that band needed Michael Anthony to just lay it down and the sound of his voice. And if you've got someone trying to sort of compete or double Eddie, then it's going to sound more like Eddie and Smile, which is a completely different animal. Right? So... Yeah, no, I mean, like, yeah, Dave, I mean, Mustaine's right for his music. That's that's what he wants, and you know, there there are musicians who can. Not everyone can do everything. There, I mean, you hear like Rudy Sarzo play, you know, that old classic rock yeah. stuff, and he just knows how to play it correctly. Where someone with a lot of Berkeley knowledge can say, "Oh, that music is easy," <laughs> and it just sounds boring and inappropriate, right? There, there is an art and a skill to be able to playing each style of music authentically. I will say that there's obviously the whole like solo bass playing thing is become a thing. And I think now it's good that it's sort of separated itself from traditional bass playing where there aren't a lot of the younger players seem to decide early. Okay. I'm going to play, you know, two eight string double neck tapping things. And they're not even going to try to play, you know, uh, ain't talking about love. Right. <laughs> that's yeah. not what they're going to do. That's a, a different aesthetic musically. Yeah, absolutely. Now, just one more final question. Besides this new album, uh, do you have anything else planned in your near future? I do. You know, um, last weekend was great. Uh, see, the weekend before, I was up in San Francisco doing a Jeff Beck tribute concert with a bunch of Bay Area musicians, right? Uh, Gretchen Mann, Eric Barnett, all the Bay Area good guys. Uh, then Friday, I was in the studio with Chad Wackerman and Toshi Yanagi. Uh, playing some songs for my new record for Roswell Pro Audio. And then Saturday, I was in the studio with George Pahone on guitar, who plays with um, uh, Black Eyed Peas and has a band called Cairo Knife Fight. So uh, Dave, uh, Dave Lombardo and I came in to lay down some, uh, 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 maybe an Ozzy song. Maybe we did a version of War Pigs, a different version, and an original tune. So that was fun. What am I doing? This record comes out. Uh, and then I'll be in, uh, starting in July, I'll be going on the tour with Greg Howe. He hasn't toured for a while. And so it's going to be Greg and I, his band. And I got my drummer, Joel Taylor on the gig. So he and I just have a thing. So that's going to be super, super fun playing Greg's music with my brother in arms and favorite drummer. Uh, and then of course in August, it's the second annual Estonian bass oasis. You know, it's my own bass camp that I go that I, that, uh, I've been running, and this year uh, Alex is coming, Mohini Day, uh, Dan Petlansky, blues player from South Africa, uh, Craig Blundell on drums. Um, so the idea in that camp is just to let uh, bass players show up and see what it's like to play uh, 
you know, with professionals. You know, it's not a base camp where there's going to be eight bass players on stage playing Stratus, right? It's going to be like, hey, you want to play prog rock? Okay, let's hear you play YYZ, and you've got me or Mohini there, and you get to play with Craig Blundell, who's played the song a million times. Play some Testament songs with Alex. Play some fusion with Alex and I. Uh, and then uh, rumors are abounding that we're going to be hitting Europe next year with uh, Michael Lee Ferkins. Uh, and doing uh, Drummer To Be Determined. We're still working that out. Um, and uh, just keep plugging the way, man. You know, teach online and uh, enjoy just living my life. Got a lot of books to read, a lot of practicing to do. And I'm already sort of thinking about my next uh, musical project. And yeah, things, things are, life is good. Yeah, awesome. Awesome. Okay, Stu, this has been an absolute honor talking to you. And I'm sure that, you know, uh, everyone else at Ultimate Guitar, including myself, and we all can't wait to hear what you have to show us on this new record. So, well, depending you know, on when I... this comes out, you can go to Indiegogo.com, Stu Ham, hold fast, yeah. help out, and then after that, <clears throat> you can just go to StuHam.com, and there will be ways for obviously you'll eventually be able to download the record uh, from all the usual sources. But if you want to order a physical copy, if you want to order an autographed copy, blah, 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 you can get all that from uh, from my website. Okay. Thank you, Stu, and I wish to see you again. Okay, cheers. Hold fast.